Um, so what we want to talk about now is how the the um, the spontaneity of a chemical reaction uh, using Gibbs free in, uh, free energy is can be equated to the electrochemical cells. All right. So how do we know how much voltage something is going to be generating? Um, we can do some uh, experimentation on that. And when when we were talking about thermodynamics before, we were talking about how energy can be used to do work. So do you remember what the definition of work is? Energy's definition is the ability to heat something or the ability to do work. Move something a certain distance. But move something. That's it. All you have to do is move something. If you move something, then you've done work. It doesn't matter how fast that thing moves as long as it moves. So if you are running a marathon, you and the person who, the, whoever won the marathon and you, if you guys are the same weight, you did the same amount of work. Why? Because you, you moved a mass 26.2 miles. The other person moved a mass 26.2 miles. So the amount of work that was actually done, scientific work that was done is equal. doesn't matter that the other person won over. That's got to do with power, um, which is work over time. So if we're doing work, I just need to move something or I need to heat something. And those are my two options. So when we as humans were trying to figure out how to use, utilize electricity, um, we, uh, well, the person who was the sort of godfather of all this electrochemical stuff is Michael Faraday. He was uh, sometime in the 1800s, and he came up with something that became uh, named Faraday's constant. And what that is, is uh, he chose coulombs and moles for his standards. And so after he passed away, they named the constant after him. And the value is this 96,484, and it's... Um, coulombs per mole and the other way you can write that is um, joules divided by volts and moles so joules is a, a type of energy and volts is basically the pressure at which the electrons are coming and moles is the number of electrons so what we're doing is we're saying this thing can do a certain amount of energy based off of how many electrons show up and how much force the electrons have does that Make sense to you? How much work can be done is really what we're talking about. And let's say you were, you're moving, you're going to move. How, um, how is the work of everybody helping you to move? How can, how would you um, gauge that? Well, what I do know is all the stuff that's in the house needs to go into the van. No matter how many people do it, this, the amount of work that's being done is going to be equal. It could be one person that does it. Or it could be 50 people that do it. Regardless, all of that stuff moved from one place to another place. And so the work is equal no matter how many people do it. But what we're interested in is, is it one person that's, you know, like, a, I don't know, let's say a 10-year-old boy. It's going to take him forever to get all that stuff in there, right? But it's still going to do the same amount of work. And we could make the work be the exact same value if 10 adults show up. So the adults versus the 10 year old would be like the difference in voltage. And then the 10 is the mole number in comparison to the one. So will the work be done? Yeah, the work will be done exactly the same. It's just one of them will be done obviously much quicker than the other. So what we end up with is um, W L E. So LE is electrical work in this case. So the electrical work is going to be equal to uh, the negative of the number of electrons that pass a point times Faraday's constant times the voltage of the cell. So E of the cell is the voltage of the cell, the thing that you guys measured last week in lab. And then the Faraday's constant, we already told you, was uh, a coulombs, uh, which is the charge of an electron and mole. And um, then we have moles there, the number of actual moles that go into the reaction. All right, so 
since Gibbs free energy is also a measure of work, I can take that WL, LE, W, the work of electricity, and swap it out and just throw in the Gibbs free energy delta G value. Okay, so that's where that delta G came from. And then we can move this a little bit further and then we can come up with a standardization. So when people are doing these things, they're gonna do these reactions at standard. So I can change these things to turn it into a uh, standard of the cell. So this, this right here is the Gibbs free energy equation. And so what we can say is Gibbs free energy equation, since we said that this thing is equal to that, and we said that this thing is equal to that, then we can make this thing equal to that. Are we okay with that? This is equal to that, that's equal to that. So that means that and this are equal to each other. All right, so over here, what we've done is we've taken those two, um, those two terms and set them equal to each other. And then we can rearrange it a little bit so we're doing them on that right side. So I've moved the moles and the Faraday's constant over to the right side. I've left the voltage of the cell there. So we know that the voltage of the cell is going to be equal to the ideal gas constant times the temperature in Kelvin divided by moles divided by Faraday's constant. And then, then we take the natural log of the, um, the uh, equilibrium constant for the cell. I know this looks jumbled, but what we've done is we've just taken this thing that we already solved for, brought it down here, and then we start throwing in the actual constants, the actual numbers that we know. So this is a version of the ideal gas law constant. This is the one that we usually use when we're talking about energy. Instead of having atmospheres and uh, liters up top, we can swap that out for uh, joules. And then here's the, that we can put this number in because that's the, the uh, temperature at which people are doing this reaction. Um, and then underneath that, this is Faraday's constant. And then I've got the N value, which will be dependent upon whichever reaction we've got. And so if I take all those numbers and multiply and divide them through, I'm left with something much more simple, which is this 0 0.025 volts divided by moles times the natural log of K. And since people don't really like the natural log of K, you can swap it out for the log of K, the log base 10 of K. And when you do that, the number changes to 0 0.0592. So this is the equation that people use to determine the cell voltage. And so you just have this number, your uh, equilibrium constant, and then the N is gonna be how many electrons got transferred in the reaction. So the first volt, uh, voltaic cell that I showed you was that copper and silver one where a copper was giving two electrons to two silver atoms. So the N for that would be two because the reaction requires two electrons to be moved. And so um, for this problem, we'd have uh, a two for this N value down here. And so Nernst takes uh, another, the next person who starts working with this, is, his name is Nernst. And he takes this and turns it into an equation that um, utilizes whatever the actual concentrations of the substances are. This kind of looks like our uh, equation that we use to determine the pH of a solution of, of a buffer. It's sort of the same thing, but in a work-related instance. So um, I take the voltage of the standard cell when I could calculate without anything. Um, then I've got uh, my Nernst equation value. And the reason Nernst did this is because he needed to know he, he moved the process from standardization. So great, we've done these, these chemical reactions in the lab under set, set conditions. But what happens if I take my battery and I move it into a real world environmental situation? Does it still work? Does anybody know what happens when it drops below zero? What happens to EV vehicles? Like people will say, oh, I want a Tesla because it's all wheel drive and it'd be really good in the snow. You're right, it actually is pretty good in the snow, but there's a huge problem with that. When the temperature drops below zero, the, the battery loses about 30% of its efficiency. So whatever your normal range is, let's say it's 300 miles, now you're at 200 miles because it's cold and it continues to drop as the temperature drops. So those days in the gorge when it was six degrees, you're getting like 120 miles out of your fully charged Tesla because the battery can't handle that temperature. They're actually trying to figure out 
a way to heat the battery with its own electricity to see if that actually makes the battery more efficient, um, even though you're losing some of the energy to heating the battery itself. Or maybe insulating it in, in a way that the interior vehicle's temperature assists with warming the battery. Regardless, um, Nernst wanted to take batteries into the real world. He was actually trying to make money off of it. And so he needed to figure out a way, like, which of these batteries could I turn into something that would actually function? and wouldn't break down the moment you you know you left your house. Um, so that's why we have Q here, because the Q, remember, is the K is your equilibrium constant, but your Q is your equilibrium constant um, when it's being stressed, when you're not at actual equilibrium. And so right now your phone batteries aren't at an equilibrium because they're constantly discharging. So there's more anode value um, because they're fairly charged because it's morning time. And so you need to use the Q instead of the K value. So when you're creating these batteries, you'd have, uh, remember the brackets mean concentrations in moles per liter. So you'd have concentration of the oxidized substance in the battery and concentration of the reduced substance in the battery. And that variation in concentration, as well as the, dist the distance between the two of those, as far as the activity series goes, um, will generate a particular charge. You divide one into the other, take the log of that, and then you throw in the rest of this um, number and you can end up with an actual voltage of what the cell is. A lot of the times the voltage is very similar to what the standardized voltage is. It's only usually during extremes, but those are pretty important to regular people. Like it's zero degrees outside, you need to go to the grocery store, you want your car battery to start. And so uh, that's another reason that the lead acid batteries are in vehicles because they, they do not suffer, uh, they suffer like a 7%, 7 to 8% um, efficiency drop when it gets cold. And the same thing happens when they get hot though too. They become less efficient when they get too hot and too cold. It's, there's a Goldilocks uh, distribution for the efficiency of batteries. Okay, so I, I know you look at this and you're like, that, that's a lot of crap. Like, why? I, and the, the real answer is I just showed you what the derivation is. All of this stuff in here isn't important. What's important is just the end result. And then actually the Nernst equation, this version of it here is really what we're going to be using. This is what everybody uses to determine how the battery works, because we all know what the standard voltage is. You could just Google that in three seconds, but that's not going to help you with your actual um, experimentation that's happening with whatever new battery you're trying to create. All right, so uh, here's a problem. We've got a uh, copper metal and I've got uh, zinc. And so I've got basically a, uh, a voltaic cell with copper and zinc. And so I've got my copper, solid metal copper, and then I've also got a 0.75 molar solution of copper, two ions. And then I've got zinc metal and I've got a 1.25 molar solution of zinc metal. And all of this is happening pretty close to room temp, about 20 degrees Celsius. So what I do first off is I go to find the standardized cell voltage that this battery would generate. And so zinc, um, zinc is 0.76 and copper is 0.34 under those circumstances where Zinc is the thing that's going to be re, uh, oxidized. Zinc is going to be giving electrons to the copper. Copper is going to be accepting those. And when you look at the equations, the zinc written as an oxidizer is 0.76 and copper written as a reduced is 0.34. And so we end up with this 1.1 volts. Uh, we've seen this one a couple of times. And so there's my 1.1 volts for my um, standardized voltage, then I just take the Nernst equation, throw in what the temperature is. It's two electrons that are getting moved from one side to the other. So that's where this two comes from. I put the zinc in as the oxidizing thing in the numerator. I put the uh, copper concentration as the reduced substance in the denominator. And I come up with a voltage. And I mean, we only went from whatever the standardized to uh, 20 degrees. So it's only going to change a tiny bit. And I mean, it changed a tiny bit, right? I mean, at one point, it's almost 1.1, but it did change. So, um, yeah, that's it. It's only five degrees off what they use for standard. So it didn't change very much, by very much. But the voltage definitely went down. So you can see as the temp drops, the voltage output of this battery is going to drop. So stuff, uh, batteries become less efficient as it gets cold. Um, there's an, an interesting side note with this. 
you don't need different metals to get a voltage generated. You can use the exact same metal and metal ion. How could that possibly be? How could I have copper and copper and still get a transfer? Because when you guys did that, that in the lab, right? Do you remember doing that? Putting copper inside and outside, did you do that? Oh, okay, well, why did I, because there's no flow, right? And it wouldn't have worked in your lab because you only had one solution concentration for the copper. But if I had given you a solution that was like one molar and a solution that was like six molar, you would actually get electron flow. Why do you think that would be the case? It's a completely different reason that we talked about a while ago. So concentration, concentration, and there's a membrane separating them. Does that sound familiar? And what are we what were we calling that? Osmosis. We were talking about that with water, right? So if the concentrations are different, you're going to get electron flow to to make the concentrations the same, to make the same number of electrons on each side. This is how your muscles fire. This is how your heart fires. So the Goldman equation is something that if you move on into healthcare, you will talk about the Goldman equation. What it's what it discusses is how your body can build up. So I've got a membrane. And on one side of the membrane, there's a concentration of sodium. And on the other side of the membrane, there's a different concentration of sodium. And as the electrons try to minimize the differences in their concentrations, that causes electrons to flow from one side to the other. And that causes the heart to fire. So your heart firing right now at the rate that it's firing is because a concentration of sodium is building up on one side of a wall and on the other side of the wall. And then there's a trigger of other ions, which include potassium and magnesium, that will cause the actual final push to get the thing to go through. And then they'll readjust themselves so the concentrations are wrong again, and then they'll make them good again. And then they'll readjust themselves to make the concentrations wrong again. And this is the process where it's basically like, I don't know, it, let's say that your heart's beating at 60 beats per minute. So every single second, they are equalizing themselves and then unequalizing themselves. So the equalizing themselves part, nature wants that. Nature wants the, uh, the difference in the chaos to be the same. They don't want a built up of concentration. And then it takes energy to get them to go the opposite direction. So you need energy to cause the concentrations to, to uh to grow. So in the same way, there's a certain concentrations of lithium atoms with the actual electron in your phone, and it's, it's going down. The number of lithium atoms in this phone right now that have its electrons are dropping as the thing discharges. Then when I plug it in, the electrons get put back on. So the concentration of lithium ions that have their electrons starts to rise. And NERTS would calculate that for you and tell you what voltage you get out of that. There actually isn't another metal inside of your battery. It's almost exclusively going to be graph, uh, graphite. Yeah, here are the concentrations for what your heart does and what your cells do to make muscles fire. So a 0.01 two molar concentration versus a 0.145 molar concentration. So we're talking about um, this is 10 times, more than 10 times less concentrated than this. And when we've reached those two different concentration values, then they're going to try to equalize themselves with electron flow transfer. And that's when the firing occurs. So I know a lot of this stuff seems esoteric and really chemistry related, but in actuality, it's what your body uses and we've figured out exactly what those values are. So if a person's having a problem with their heart, they're having AFib, um, which is the, the heart not fully compressing instead of it like crushing and then opening and crushing and opening, it'll like partially crush and not get a full, um, full flow. And that can happen to people who 
um, especially under extreme circumstances, uh, heavy duty activity, you're not getting the correct flow. And then when that doesn't happen, then you're not getting oxygenation of the blood. And um, then the heart muscle itself cannot be fed. And then that's when you'll have uh, heart stoppage. That, do you guys know who, um, uh, sorry, uh, I don't know why names escaping me. Played for Loyola Marymount. He actually died on the basketball court playing against Portland's or University of Portland. Oh, my bias. That guy died of cocaine. What was that guy's name? One sec. Paint gathers. All right. So one of the best basketball players in the country, he was leading his team to another victory. He went up, he dunked the basketball, fell, um, landed on the floor, went to turn around and walk back down the court, and he just collapsed. And it was because he his body wasn't... This differentiation of this one point or 0 0.12 molar and this 0.145 molar wasn't able to re-equalize itself and it stopped. So he, he was in such good physical shape that this problem with his heart wasn't detected until he was at the absolute most extreme circumstance going on. And then it manifested itself and killed it. It was terrible. Like it literally just died on the floor and nobody knew what was going on. That was I mean, if this had happened, actually did happen to LeBron James' son. I don't know if any of you have heard this. LeBron James' son, the same exact thing happened. But we're in a completely different mindset ever since Hank died. The moment somebody collapses on a basketball court, I mean, he laid there for like three minutes before anybody did anything. They're like, what's wrong with him? And now it was like he passes out on the court, um, LeBron's son, and they're immediately out there giving him CPR, like in – 15 seconds he's getting cpr and now they've done some modifications for him and he's playing basketball again but at this time when this happened this heart condition was something that people weren't uh weren't aware of and and didn't uh didn't know how to handle